Hello everybody and welcome. Oh, I hope you all are doing well today. I hope you are safe and um, enjoying somewhat of the beautiful weather. Hopefully the weather's beautiful wherever you're joining us from. Uh, my name is Ariel Hunter. I'm the Community Outreach Coordinator here at the Elkhorn Slough Reserve. And today I'll be bringing you the story of transportation in the Elkhorn Slough as part of our Weaving Yesterday's history series. Now this is a history series that we've been doing um, since May and the first Saturday of every month we have been uh, sharing different stories, different vignettes, uh, different peaks into the past of the Elkhorn Slough watershed. Um, and a lot of the places that we are coming to you from are spots that you can visit. Uh, I will mention that uh, our internet service, some of these spots, is not always exceptional. So I have already lost one newsfeed. Uh, I moved to a different location and everybody keep your fingers crossed that this location will stay A plus, exactly what I needed. Um, please feel free to share your thoughts, your comments, and your questions in the comments box down at the bottom of the video that you're watching. Um, I will try to answer questions here in the field and our team um, always answers questions that we get on these uh, live feeds after the fact as well. So if I don't know the answer to your history question today, I will go look it up and I will find you an answer because we are all about learning here. Uh, today, I will say, uh, if you have any uh, cool thoughts or you or your family have lived in this area and you remember what some of the places that I talk about or that I share looked like uh, 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, 100 years ago, please share that in the comments. We are all history nerds here and we all want to know. So with that, I'm going to dive in today and I'm going to give you the view that I have here. And I want you for a moment to think back uh, about 200 years before the railway that's standing in front of me was here, before the farms on the hillsides in the background were here, you would be looking at a series of low rolling hills, which you can still see in the distance, and then this flat, marshy, muddy slough. And in fact, this middle center section of the Monterey Bay, where the Elkhorn Slough Reserve sits, this is a low land. It's flat, it's muddy, um, it's defined by water. And this area is, when you're thinking about transportation around this area, there's a lot of challenges that come up because mud and marsh are not always an ideal substrate to move through. So as we talk today about some of the changes to transportation that have gone on in the Elkhorn Slough and the surrounding watershed, I want you to think about how those changes may have affected this area and how this area affected decisions that were made to those transportations and how they will affect decisions made to transportation in the future. Now, California received statehood after the gold rush. So in 1848, we had a huge flurry of people coming out to this state, lured by the chance to get rich, mining gold out of the hillsides and the rivers. A lot of them were coming into Northern California, and Northern California had this big boom in population that was then followed by people staying and living and building towns and setting up new industries. Now in the Monterey Bay area, in the 1850s onwards, we saw an increase in whaling because we have several species of whale that migrates up and down the coast here. We saw the rise of logging. People came out to take advantage of the redwoods, um, but also in part some of the oaks that you can still see standing on the hills behind us. And as these industries started to boom, they brought more and more people to this site. And one of the industries that boomed the biggest in at least our portion here of the Monterey Bay was agriculture. So agriculture in the 1850s started to move in to the Pajaro Valley in Watsonville and the Salinas Valley in, just below us. And so Elkhorn Slough here was positioned as a water body between two of the most fertile agricultural spaces. 
And so it became of great interest to try to figure out how to transport along it. And this main channel of the slough that you all can see out here that people maybe have kayaked in or um, have birded along the edges of, this channel initially was deeper, it was a little bit wider, and it became of great interest to uh, local industries to use it for transport. And so one of the first ways that people use transportation, or that Western civilization, I should say, used transportation out in the Elkhorn Slough here was by boat. And I want to show you a couple of pictures here. The first is one of the first boats that sailed along the slough transporting produce was a 157 ton steamer called the Salinas. And I like to show this because when I think of my boating time spent on the Elkhorn Slough, I think of shallow, muddy bottomed areas, and I cannot imagine how a steamer ship would get through here. But I read that this area was initially deeper. This channel was more channelized, and you also had the Salinas River really merging into the slough. And so you could pilot a boat through the slough. It was certainly challenging. Um, this next image I'll show you is a map I'm not exactly sure what date this map, da this map dates from. I know that for sure it was built sometime after the 1870s because if you look up real close, you can see that there are railroad tracks in it. And I know that it was built before the 1940s when a harbor was dug out here in Moss Landing because you can see on this map that the mouth of the slough is north of what is currently the Moss Landing Harbor. So. Not exactly sure what the date is, but somewhere between 1870 and 1940, this map was made, and it gives you a good idea of what this area looked like. You can see the Elkhorn Slough as it stands today. The reserve is roughly this area here. You can see the railroad tracks merging through. I also highlighted that along the railroad tracks, this is where the gun club would sit. We'll talk about that in a moment. Hudson's Landing, if you've been there or live near there, is up here towards the north bend of the Elkhorn Slough. Moss Landing is down here in the south end of the slough, just off center. And the orange highlight is Elkhorn Road. So if you've ever driven down our winding road, that's where you are on this map. Now, you can notice that up north you have the Pajaro watershed. And just behind these hills, you have Castroville, which was a hub for getting produce from Salinas. So if you were going to transport fresh produce, to places like San Francisco in the 1850s, 60s, and 70s. You were not going to do that by car. That would take too long, the produce would rot. So you had to do it by boat. And if you wanted to, if you had your farm way back here in the back ends of the watershed, you had to get your boat or your produce out to a harbor or out to a water port like Moss Landing. And that was expensive. But the Elkhorn Slough was positioned in such a way here in the middle of both of these areas that you, they were able to sail along it. So they set up a couple of different landings and the one that you can see really well today is Hudson's Landing at the north end of the Elkhorn Slough, um, which is just off of a section of Elkhorn Road itself. Hudson's Landing, which was initially called Watsonville Landing, was just a pier set up. People could drive their produce down to this landing and a boat like the Salinas, the steamer ship that I just showed you, um, or the Vaquero, which was a, a stern wheeler, a flat sailing boat, would take your produce from the top here, sail it down the middle of the channel until you got to this area in front of us, and then would sail you out past this bend to the harbor and could transport to Moss Landing. Now, by the late 1870s, there was a lot of interest in building some kind of wharf um, out at Moss Landing. And Charles Moss, who, yes, Moss Landing is named for, uh, purchased in the land or leased the land that was out um, near modern day, oh, what's right there, uh, kind of near the, the South Harbor area. Um, and he built a wharf. Give me a moment, I'll show you a picture of that too. So. Charles Moss and Cato Vieira of the Vieira, the Vieira family, 
work together to build um, sections off of here that could sustain a wharf. And they built warehouses and they could bring in whaling boats at this warehouse, but primarily they were there for agriculture. So agricultural goods could be transported onto bigger ships and sent up to San Francisco to make a lot of money. So that Moss Landing site became a big hub for transportation to a wider audience. And at the same time, in the late 1870s, as the same time as we see transportation revolving around the Elkhorn Slough, we also see an industrial revolution across the world um, that affects produce especially because they start developing faster ways of producing, uh, they start uh, making more efficient irrigation techniques, and suddenly farmers have this increased capacity to produce. And so now they need an increased capacity to transport. And so for a period from the 1850s to the 1870s, um, the, that transportation system was dominated by boats here on the Elkhorn Slough. Now, in 1872, that would change irrevocably when the Southern Pacific Railroad built tracks for part of its Oakland to LA line along the Elkhorn Slough. And if you are going to build a railroad track, and that railroad track is this one existing today that if you've been out to the reserve, you have seen, uh, it is still an active line, which is why my setup is off to the side of the railroad tracks and not on them. Uh, this line was part of a huge push across America to build railroads. And railroads at the time were the future. They were how people were going to transport faster. They were the solution to getting your, your produce farther and to more markets. And as this rail line came in, it quickly in the next two decades dominated the, the transportation market out here. And we saw the disappearance of barges, especially since too, out in the main channel, changes to the land around the Elkhorn Slough, changes to the hillsides, um, logging of some of the trees and uh, changing of some of the grasslands into, into ranches or into agriculture, that caused increased uh, siltation, which is uh, the basically increased erosion effects. Um, and that made it so that that 150 seven ton steamer ship that I showed you earlier was not going to be able to pass through this waterway anymore. It was a much shallower system that we're used to today. And so there wasn't really a market for the boats anymore and it was becoming more and more impassable for them to get through here. And by the 1880s and 1890s for sure, the railroad was really the dominant form of transportation. And this rail line, I mentioned earlier, this goes from Oakland to LA, but it is part of a larger rail system that actually goes all the way from Seattle to LA. And you can still ride it to this day. Um, it's called the Coast Starlight Line. Um, and it gives you an incredible view of the habitats in the areas, including Elkhorn Slough, throughout California. Now, at the same time, they also built separate rail lines. I can show you one of those on the map as well. Down in the dunes area, they built a small line out this way. And it was owned and operated, or trains owned and operated, by the Spreckles Sugar Company would actually transport along this rail line. This one is now discontinued. Um, but it was an additional one that was put in in that era when railroads were king and they were becoming the, the future of transportation across this area. I do have a wonderful photo of one of the trains running through the slough here. I couldn't quite decipher where exactly in the slough or along the slough this is, but based off the marshy edges here and the, the background of mountains, I suspect it's probably towards the north end. And if you were a railroad engineer trying to build through and alongside a marsh, one of the biggest issues was the subsidence, the sinking of this area and the mud itself. And so most of the ways that they built this rail line here was by pushing in a lot of gravel 
um, a lot of sediment to try to build up the area. And I'm going to see if I can get this to show you the whole line over here. If you look off in the distance, you can just see how the road or the railroad track dips a little bit. It does sink a little and it does flood because this area, this waterway is dominated by the tides. So you can imagine that if you were an engineer in the 1870s building this rail line, it was very difficult to try to put this together. It took a lot of human power to build it. Um, but when it was done, it created this incredible way to transport not only produce, but also people. And that's what it's transporting today as well. So though it did stem some of the, the tidal flow in the area, and though it definitely took out some of the marshes, uh, the railroad itself was actually heavily impacted by the slough and almost more impacted by the slough than it impacted to this habitat right here um, by those tides that flood it every, every year in the winter. Around the 1900s or the early 1900s, um, we did have a gun club that set itself up right across the way here on what is Hummingbird Island. Um, this spot where I'm standing would have been a flag stop. And so we call this area Whistle Stop Lagoon because it was a place where the whistle stop would sound and uh, you would hop off if you were one of the members of the gun club. And you could then walk through the area, stay at the lodge that used to live or that used to stand on this island, which we talked about in a previous Weaving Yesterday's installment, um, and spend the weekend hunting down here. So along with the railroad came new things like this gun club, like hunting and fishing um, and new people and new uh, industries happening out here. And they definitely had an effect on populations of organisms. They definitely had an effect on uh, the habitats, but it's important to understand how people uh, created those industries, how those industries evolved so that we can address those impacts going forward and find a place where we can have both um, our transportation and our beautiful marsh habitat and the organisms that come with it. And that compromise is what we as uh, conservation managers, as stewards, as educators are always working towards is finding ways to make these worlds that have previously collided merge together better. By the 1940s, of course, the car had really become the primary way that people were transporting themselves, um, especially into the 50s and 60s and 70s and modern day trucks were transporting instead of trains. Um, they became the premier way that a farm was going to get their produce across the state or across the county. Um, and so we did see a reduction in the train activity along this railroad. Although, like I said earlier, it's still through Amtrak, transports people back and forth across the state. Um, and one of the things that I thought was curious, looking at the idea of transport, um, was the idea of how did you make this area accessible to cars as you developed cars in the 20s and 30s? And this is a, a, a drawing, so it's a painting, it's not a map, uh, or it's not a um, map designed specifically for locating things, it's designed for aesthetic, but it gives you a great look into what the mouth of the slough looked like um, back in the 18 hundreds. And you can see, I've pointed out on here the Salinas River. So this is, we're kind of at the mouth of the slough facing south is what this image shows you. And you can see the Moss Landing Wharf and Warehouse right out here near what's present day the South Harbor. You can see the Salinas River winding in. You can see the Elkhorn Slough itself up here along the bottom and Moro Coho in the distance and Castroville in the distance. And what's really cool is you can see the Highway 1 ferry. So back in the 1800s or the late 1800s, when you needed to cross Elkhorn Slough, there was not a road, there was a ferry. And this ferry was owned um, and operated by the Vieira family, I believe. And that would transport you across the road if you were coming in from the south. So the next time you're driving across Highway 1 uh, north through Moss Landing, Think about how people had to ferry themselves across the water there because um, the slough was a big, deep channel.
Now, the Vieiras actually in the 1900s, um, with the rise of the train, they actually built a bridge across what was their ferry system. And I do have a picture of it. It is a little grainy, so I apologize ahead of time, but I will post the photos that I use um, into the comments at the end of this so you can get a closer look at them. This was the Highway 1 ferry. So you can see this, I believe, is the north section. This is the south. This is, of course, the slough in the middle. And you can see what looks like a horse-drawn carriage going across it. Um, this and the building of bridges, the building of highways, um, this allowed for cars to expand as well and it allowed for people to transport themselves in a different way without relying on the railroads. And so by modern times, um, by the 1970s and 80s, transportation in the Elkhorn Slough uh, no longer included boat unless you count kayaks and the tour boats that come and look at the wildlife. Cars and highway, we're using Highway 1 and surrounding roadways to access areas. And the trains had diminished. They were just passenger trains at this point in time. And as we, as a reserve established in, we do a lot of research around the human impacts of, or in this area, and all of the historical impacts. Um, our stewardship team looks at how humans have influenced this land um, and we have a history of human use in this area of over 10,000 years because the indigenous Mutsin culture who are still here today, they were living and using and modifying these surrounding lands for uh, 10,000 years of the past. But as we look at that history and as we look at how people have influence this area, how they've changed it. Um, we also look at how we can improve it for the future. And I encourage you, if you are curious about human impacts, to look at our website. We have a lot of great information there. Um, and feel free to send us questions or send us thoughts because we are constantly evolving. We are constantly finding new ways to live in this system and be at peace both with the human connections here and the human uses here, as well as with the organisms.